welcome to A Moment of Bach, where we take our favorite moments from the composer's vast musical output, just a minute's worth or even a few seconds, and we show you why we think they are remarkable. We are your hosts, Alex and Christian Giebert. Today, we have three short moments for you, transitional moments from the St. Matthew Passion. Jesus sat down with the twelve disciples, and as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? This famous moment from the Passion Story is set in Bach's St. Matthew Passion. The listener Dave sent us a very nice message, or a series of messages, And I latched on to one of them because as this episode is being released, it is Holy Week. And at the end of this week, it will be Good Friday, which is the commemoration and storytelling opportunity through music, I think, for a lot of church musicians and people who have concerts right now, about Christ's death. And surely some people around the world are performing the St. Matthew Passion at this time. It got me thinking, what makes those two uh, Bach passions so different than everything else? They're longer than a average cantata. They have a lot of similarities to cantatas, the interplay between the different parts, the commentary, the different characters. Mm -hmm. They're in some way just a way more developed version with more characters, full-on oratorios. But I think the strongest and the most emotionally impactful parts of the St. Matthew Passion might be the pairs, the pairs of parts that when one follows the other, it's just absolutely soul-crushingly heartbreaking because of the way the one follows the other. When one part ends and the next part begins, because of who is speaking and because of what they say. So I found a few of those moments to put together, and Dave gave me this idea, and I'd like to use one of his. He says that he was in Orange County, California, so Alex, a local person, at least at this time in his life, he was going to a Chapman College chorale concert. Uh, They had a performance of the St. Matthew Passion. Nowadays, this is called Chapman University, Mm -hmm. and it's a stone's throw away from where Alex and I grew up, actually, in Orange, California. And Dave says about that performance, the one moment that struck him to be the most beautiful, uplifting, and absolving moment occurred when the Erbarma Dich Alto aria transitions to the next chorale. This got me thinking about my favorite transitional moments in the St. Matthew Passion. All the disciples at the table said, Lord, is it me? Is it me who betrayed you? We know from the story that that it was Judas. But in each in their own way, they failed him. So Bach does a a brilliant bit of cacophonous counterpoint as we hear everybody in the first choir. The St. Matthew Passion is divided into two choirs and orchestras. So we hear from the first choir. They are the disciples right now. And they are saying, is it I? Is it I? And then everyone sings, it is I whose sin now binds thee, with anguish deep surrounds thee, and nails thee to the tree. The torture thou art feeling, thy patient love revealing. Tis I should bear it, I alone. In the German, the disciples sing, Herr bin ich's, and then everyone joins in to sing, Ich bin's. So it's really nice little, just linguistically, Mm. it's a nice little mirror. Is it I? It is I. But it doesn't work as nicely in English, actually. Mm. Yeah. The tiny moment of the chaos of them all shouting over each other, is it me, is it me, Lord, occurs in a minor key, a key of F minor, a particularly dissonant area to be in, especially related to where we've been so far. We're going to move around a lot tonally in the entire passion for sure. And then did you notice, Alex, that when we all sing it is solidly in the relative major key of a flat major and we are there until end of that chorale
You know, I think sometimes we don't say enough about how how Bach uses these little these little inner movements, whether they're the recitatives or the evangelist recitatives or the the little chorale movements to get us from key center to key center. He has to do that because there's never a moment in this where the keys don't make sense the way that they segue. Mm-hmm. The whole thing is is continuous. It's remarkable. And and I mean, it, to to be fair, it's it's pretty transparent what what he does, right? In the ariosos that that are preceding each aria, that's when he like that's when he can change keys. And then in the aria itself, it stays, and it has a set structure. And mm-hmm. for the chorale melodies that are the like the one that we just came into here, those don't end in a different key or anything. They stay there. But his yeah, and his his evangelist recitatives are another are the other point at which he can move keys. There's a feeling in them of like sussing out or searching out a key. They're right. so which unstable works, sometimes. Yeah, which works with the text sometimes. I mean it's like it, it also it always serves to paint the text, right? It so, drives the story forward. Yeah. And then when we have the chorale interspersals, we have, it is I who sin binds thee. That's a statement of fact that is unchanging. So that receives a, a stable tonality. I mean, he had to. He was working with a melody that has a clear tonality implied in it. So he couldn't move around as much as he did in the connecting sections. But I love that. I love the orchestration choice of Lord, is it me? Only the first choir and orchestra. And then both choirs, it is me. Mm. That's nice because it's not a commenting second choir that says this. Because actually I thought it was the first time I uh, ever experienced the St. Matthew Passion. I thought there was the one that was the disciples and then the other half was the commenting people that were the stand-in for us. But it isn't. It's everyone singing because it was them and it's us. The juxtaposition of the characters of the Passion story saying their piece of the Bible and then the commentary that brings it to us in the audience is what makes this work exceptional, you know? I mean, at least what makes the text of this work exceptional. Box music is doing a lot of the heavy lifting of it, but that is just absolutely remarkable about about the St. Matthew and St. John Passions. It's what pushes it over the edge to be in my top handful of greatest works of all time, I think. Because the the Mass in B minor is a towering masterwork, but it's a little bit of a showcase of his best work. And the cycle of preludes and fugues are similar collection-based things. And even like Goldberg Variations is... It has a it has a whole structure to it, but the Saint Matthew Passion is narration focused, and yet he gave himself all of the tools that he could possibly need, and the agility at which he transitions between section to section, it's so great. I I struggle with the terminology to call these things because is it a moment if we're talking about the transition between two moments? I guess it it has to be because they they're all in context. They're almost little transitory moments in yeah. and of themselves. Yeah. But you know, a transitory moment is still a a moment and it can even be the little silence between the movements that is a special moment. I I always think of that after and I think you'll get to it in your third moment today that's where silence plays a big a big role. But, Definitely. Yeah. Sometimes we mean when we say in music theory transition we're talking about a functional like section of a sonata or something. But that's not really what's happening here. We're talking We're talking about Bach's own storytelling, just like our last episode, Alex. Mm. The storytelling dictates the structure. Mm. We don't worry about sonata form and going back to this key and doing this and this key and that. We he changes keys for a different reason. He changes into F minor to convey the franticness of is it me? Is it me? And then a momentary settling into the relative major for it was all of us, and then right back into the narration with more um, nebulous key areas. It's just agile. When the storytelling informs the structure, that's better when, than the other way around. 
because it allows the storytelling to be the, the main thing. Because mm-hmm. the structure is just supposed to serve the story. Everything serves the text here. Yeah, it has to be this way. Yeah. I got to bring up video games again. Sorry, uh, listeners. But <laughs> this is how I feel about video games too. Like I'd rather a video game there. The storytelling is absolutely forefront and then the structure comes later. Yeah, and not, not everyone would agree with you about that. No, they wouldn't. I'm going to make two examples, but this is just because it's when I grew up. But growing up, Final Fantasy VII is a game that's very much storytelling driven, probably to the detriment of the other things about it. But it's the story comes first, right? It's The stuff that happens in the game is all driven by plot uh, and character development and everything. But then let's take a more modern example, Breath of the Wild, Zelda Breath of the Wild, the game I've just recently played for the first time. And it's it's stunningly beautiful and an amazing experience, but it's also like completely organized by the structure. Like the game has a set structure. As soon as I sort of felt what was going on with the structure, I knew that I wouldn't be surprised by anything in the game anymore. Well, that's the that's the problem, I think. Yeah, and it it was still a great experience, by the way. But like, it's different. It's not going to surprise me. And you know, even if you're familiar with this passion story, even reading the Bible, sometimes you can be surprised by that the order in which the story happens, and then like the setups and the payoffs to use storytelling jargon, you know, of of the things that happen in the Bible story and the way that the that for instance the Peter where he tells. Peter that he will deny him, and Peter denies that he will, but then eventually he does. But then after Jesus is, is resurrected, he then calls out Peter on it by, in kind of a gentle way, by asking him to feed his sheep three times in a row, when, when Peter denied him three times. You know, the little foreshad- the the, re- the recalling of that. Mm-hmm. And all these little storytelling devices that are just beautiful in this and that have informed like all of our modern stories. Yeah. But if you let the structure dictate it, then you force it. So Bach just lets this story absolutely be at the forefront. And when it's time for a corral, he he bring he pulls in a resource from a, an external resource, a existing yeah. melody. And that's that's like your Final Fantasy Seven example right there, because that story drives the places you go in that world. But yet also there was like a team designing the, you know, gameplay system too. So every once in a while they found their moments to have a combat sequence. But yeah. it's it's always at the like, right time. It's like a set piece in a movie, yeah, right? It happens. You can tell when a when set's it's supposed to happen. Yeah, you could tell that when a movie is like, oh, we're just going from set piece to set piece, from action sequence to action sequence, rather than like this is story driven and it's cool and something happens that's exciting, but I care because the story led me to this point. Instead of just, oh, we got to go through the motions of following a three-act structure in a movie. We got to get these characters from this place to this place. That's so boring. Or like, I know why there was content that I'm playing through right now. Because this section had to be this long because everything else was this long. Right. Yes, there's a structure to this game. There are four of these types of dungeons. And once I've played one, I know the other three are going to be the same or whatever. (laughs) Yeah. It's, It's like, okay, I can have fun with that, but I can turn my brain off a little. I'd rather have something engaging, you know? story-wise. And that's what the German people that showed up to these these passions, that's what they had in store for them. Amazing surprises one after another of who knows what's going to happen. Are we going to reflect on this? Oh, I'm now we're reflecting on that in a different way. And Bach and Picander are showing me that how I feel about this and how we feel about this is, as opposed to just Jesus or the people surrounding him. It's, it's just yeah, really... It's artistry of the highest level. It's showing how it matters to you this isn't like this isn't just some old dusty story like this is absolutely relevant to your life that's what Bach is saying mm-hmm. and now here is that first moment the Lord is it I transition
So Dave mentions that after the Er Barma Dich Alto aria, there is the transition to the next chorale, Bin ich gleich von dir gewichen. We are completely exhausted by the empathy evoked from the aria, and suddenly, ever so gently and softly, in a key that begins one step above the final note of Er Barma Dich, the chorale begins and lifts us out of the pit. Dave remarks, what genius. That and the text of the beautiful chorale was and is pure law and gospel, despair and hope, fear and love. Tears overflowed then and still does to this day whenever I hear it, which is usually during the season of Lent. And that's what made Dave so interested in our take on the transitions in the St. Matthew Passion. Can I just say thank you to listener Dave and to all the listeners who've written in to us and, and told us about your moments. It's so cool. We love to hear this and we love we love that you got so much out of this, you know, and that's what we're, you know, obviously that's like what we're evangelizing with this podcast is about getting a lot out of Bach. So thank you, Dave. And we get a lot out of it, out of your suggestions too. This moment occurs at a pivotal time. As we know from a previous Moment of Bach episode, the text here for this aria was, Have mercy, Lord, on me. Regard my bitter weeping. Look at me. Heart and eyes both weep to thee bitterly. It happens right after Peter denies Jesus three times. And it winds to a close. Right after it does so, we hear the following words sung as a chorale. Lamb of God, I fall before thee, humbly trusting in thy cross. That alone be all my glory. All things else I count but loss. Jesus, all my hope and joy, flow from thee, thou sovereign good. Hope and love and faith and patience all were purchased by thy blood. So the duality that Dave gets at here is on full display. There's the culpability of our human condition versus the saving uh, blood of Jesus that saves that, and that's important within the box Lutheran theology. Mm. And there's our own fear versus Christ's love, our own despair versus our hope in this gospel promise of you know, the outcome of this story, even though it's miserably sad as we tell it. Yeah, it's just absolutely, again, it's artistry of really the highest order. It's worth reminding you, if you forgot this, listener, that this music, all the arias and the big chorus movements and and the transitional stuff is all written by Bach, is all completely original, but the chorale melodies, those would have been absolutely well known to the audience. So listening to this unbelievably beautiful aria, the Erbarmadik aria, the famous one that happens you know, before this transition moment, have mercy, Lord, on me, and all that, getting getting the audience to this absolutely open-hearted state. (laughs) 
and then going into the corral that they that they knew. And as Dave mentions, the key relation is important there. It's like it goes from it goes from that minor key into something a little more hopeful, and it go and it gets there in a, a very smooth musical way and it answers it kind of answers the question like a lot of these chorales do the other one answered a literal question that is it i this one it's a little bit less of a literal question but it's about what we should be trusting in the words of this chorale talking about trusting in the cross and all things else i count but loss and all this stuff kind of reminds me of the words to the uh contemporary christian song lead me to the cross by brooke liggard wood mm-hmm. do you know this it's a nice song it's got really good lyrics very much similar theme to this chorale text there's so much in here about leading us to fall before the cross. Mm-hmm. And St. John Passion as well, following Jesus' footsteps mm-hmm. even towards, right. towards the cross. And now here is that second moment. Speaking of the relationship between something that Jesus did and something that we must do, this extends even to death. And that brings us to our last moment, the darkest one of all, the moment of Jesus' death, and the lead up to it goes like this. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama asabtani. That is, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And Bach's setting and the the slick transition from the evangelist narrating to Jesus calling that out passionately is so brilliantly done and then interpreted by this performance. Some of them that stood there, when they heard that, said, He calls for Elias, Elijah. And straight away one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. And the rest said, Let him be. Let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost.
this point in the story, Jesus dies, and then we all sing. Be near me, Lord, when dying. O part not thou from me. Now, why are we talking about ourself in this in this moment? It just seems right. the the first thing I think is like, well, that's a little bit selfish. I mean, like Jesus literally just died, and the very next thing we're doing is saying, "I hope that I can receive comfort when it comes my time." You know, and we go on, "When my heart must languish, release me from my anguish by your own pain and woe." Well, it's because of that very same gospel thing where Jesus takes that upon Himself. He was unsupported when he died, even though he was God. He said, "Why have you forsaken me?" And we don't have to bear that same burden in our death anymore because of, because he did that. So that's the powerful theological sentiment that is being conveyed there, and the silence, as you put it, Alex, that Bach uses at that moment is quite profound. The really, really light organ continuo was all we get. After the evangelist says he passed away, is really w- how to translate that. I think. Yeah. And we get just a five-one, just the old cadence of it has to be the most basic of all music endings. The cadence five to one is used here, as if to say mm-hmm. that's it. But when it goes on, this time, our chorale, which is a chorale that we spent a whole episode on, Alex, two seasons ago. Yep. That one occurs in the same key and ends openly in our modern ears. It, it does not close to a uh, finished cadence, but really in the half cadence, cadence, right? Yeah, in the half yeah. cadence, and in the in the in an even older sense, it's just like Phrygian. You know, yeah, it's, it's a mo- it's a yeah. mode. It, we we actually kind of spend a lot of time talking about how modalism is outdated by then but but he does do it every once in a while especially on the more like on the the more like heart-wrenching stuff you know he uses the really old sounds yeah yeah and now here is that third moment the moment of Jesus' death. If these three musical moments have inspired you to hear the rest of the St. Matthew Passion, please see the link in the episode description to see this wonderful performance of that work by the Netherlands Bach Society. It's a video I return to time and time again. Do you want to hear our new episodes as we release them? Find us on your podcast app and hit subscribe. And thanks again to listener Dave and our other listeners who have sent in suggestions. We love to hear that stuff. Alex, what we will be looking at next week? We're going to be looking at the cantata Bleib bei uns, BWV6. 
Until next time, enjoy those moments. <laughs>